Good morning. I'd like to apologize. Uh, our president, Catherine Chevillot, cannot come. She was very happy to be here, but she was supposed to attend a meeting on the security of the Palais des Chaillots, the establishment in charge of this site. Uh, could not do without her, so she is apologizing, and she wishes that you have a fruitful day, and she would like me to speak on her behalf. So the president of the Ministry of Culture, the Ministry General of Heritage and Architecture, members of the Scientific Council and Steering Committee of um, the History of Teaching at the 20th Century, the directors of the École Nationale Supérieure d'Architecture, teachers, researchers, dear public. So, on behalf of Catherine Chevillot, I'd like to say that the Cité La Maison de l'Architecture is the home of teachers. And when the Comité de l'Histoire du Ministère de la Culture started a research program on teaching, La Cité de l'Architecture du Patrimoine joined this project and organized its symposium five years ago on the 19th and the 20th of February 2016. So historical um, reports were made in other countries, United States, Germany, but in France there was very fragmentary work, very little work, and we couldn't really deliver knowledge on the history of this teaching. However, this teaching was um, substantially transformed in France uh, several times. And we have to keep adapting ourselves all the time because knowledge is changing all the time. Architecture is both an art and even more so. And it is a responsibility that is related to the history of societies and its expectations. For all our generations here, the most obvious transformation is that of the 1968 reform with the end of the Beaux-Arts system and a deep renewal born by new uh, learning and architectural units. But since 1900, the system hadn't been as mon monolithic and immobile as we believe, inspired by the thoughts of society, it became more democratic, it was more decentralized, it didn't remain inert with the questioning of the modern society. After May 1968, teaching architecture kept evolving and it is still changing today to prepare architects to play their role so that they remain permeable to contemporary history and to the change of knowledge. This program is led by a scientific team with Anne-Marie Châtelet, Marie-Jeanne Dumont, Daniel Le Codic, whom I'd like to welcome on behalf of Catherine Chevillot. This team wrote this investigation over a long period of time, and the bet was to have this in all the teaching units. And she organized for five years the decisive contribution of the architecture schools. Each school did its job. The researchers collected the archives, written, graphic, oral, the testimonies. They shared the analyses in cross-sectorial seminars organized within their walls. And this anchoring of each school in a particular story will be a resource for our contemporary thought. Thanks to this method, this work was very fruitful, and today we have a presentation of all the results. The publication of L'Encyclopédie de l'Architecture en ses écoles in 2022 will crown this enterprise. We will give this work here, architecture, all the space it deserves. We promise you that. And in this expectation, I wish you all a very fruitful day full of exchanges.
Good morning, and thank you for being here. So we are back in the auditorium where we were a few years ago. The loop is looped, so we are back to where we had begun on the 19th and 20th of February 2016 when we launched this project on the history of teaching. In the meantime, we went around all the national architectural schools in France. We thought it would end in 2020, but the pandemic changed things. And so therefore, it is in 2004 that we will end this after having um, fulfilled our assignments. So after this adventure, I'd like to thank all those who climbed into the ship with us and who made this journey possible. It's up to me to express their gratitude and to mention what happened during this entire adventure. So we would like to first turn towards the Comité de l'Histoire of the Ministry of Culture, its enthusiasm without which we wouldn't be here today. We'd like to gratefully thank the president, Marie-Yvonne de saint clojean and she always supported us, convinced that the academic world has to talk about the history of public policies and to explore a field of research that had been neglected until then. Geneviève Gentil launched this project. The Secretary General, successive Secretary Generals, Guillaume Bourgeois, Agathe Delège, who followed everything, who told about the steps in the research book of uh, the Comité de l'Histoire, and I suppose you all know about this history committee. And uh, the members, Florence Contenay, Arlé Auduc, who knows about the ministry and its history, whose continuous engagement always guided us, and Françoise Chalin, whose aura and writing will help us close this project. He will present the encyclopedia with Amandine Diener at the end of this day today. So this project benefited from the joint help of the Ministry of Architecture, the Bureau de la Recherche Architecturale des Paysages et de la Recherche, and Agnès Vin, who was in charge of architecture at the time when we launched it and we put it in the recommendations of the Stratégie de l'enseignement supérieur, Philippe Convoni, who was in charge of um, research, who asked us to talk about its progress in a regular publication. It is to him that we owe the Cahier de Saint-Savin and Corinne Thierry Ono, who succeeded him and who ensured the program the following years. The steering committee of this uh, enterprise brought together all the people I've mentioned, and it was fleshed out by the presence of qualified members from the Ministry of Culture, from the Cité de l'Architecture et du Patrimoine. From the Ministry of Culture, we had Stéphanie Sell, who is Director of Research and Architecture, Vincent Bois, Patrice Guérin, who were in charge of the archives uh, section at the Ministry of Ar Architecture, Marie-Hélène Conta, who we've just heard, Gilles Bienvenu, former lecturer at the École Nationale Supérieure de Nantes, Jean-Lucien Bonillo, Emeritus Professor at the School in Marseille, Richard Klein, Professor at the École Nationale Supérieure de Lille, and Jean-Louis Violo, Professor at the School in Nantes. Like any scientific program, there was a board with historians and with architectural schools, universities from Europe and the United States. We had Barry Bertel, Luc Nopin, Klaus Jan Philipp. Among the historians of the contemporary world and education, we had Jean Michel Legnaud, Pascal Laurie, Antoine, Antoine Pro, and Rebecca Rogers. Among the those interested in architecture, Jean Pierre Ebon, Philippe Boudon, Jean Luc Cohen, and Jacques Lucon. And and they are warmly thanked 
and we are particularly thinking about two of them who were with us in 2016 and who couldn't see the end of the project, Peter Bleu-Nonchons, professor at the University of Sheffield, and Jean-Pierre Penaud, I suppose you all know him here, honorary professor at the École Nationale Supérieure d'Architecture, who was, uh, who uh, passed away last April. I'd like to go back to the ambitions of this project. The idea was born from a statement. We had forgotten about the history of architecture in the 20th century. In 1970, the Modern Art Museum in New York had um, organized an exhibition on architecture and had led a few historians. Later on, researchers uh, developed interest in the architecture and Beaux-Arts after the 50th anniversary of this event that was celebrated here by the May 68 exhibition. But the 20th century, between the two wars, the 30 Glorious remained in the shadows. Even worse, it was put in contempt, and it was the most pitiful history in the teaching of architecture in France. In 68, it was the year zero of architecture, and others believed that the 19th century was the best century. In the meantime, decades had passed, and nobody was interested in those years. This amnesia led to a contempt in the past of these schools, not only the Beaux-Arts, but also the regional architectural schools that were created in 1903, ancestors of the current École Nationale Supérieure. And our objective was dual, first to list the archives that were disappearing and to make the people in charge of the different establishments aware uh, on the whole point of these archives under the management of Arlette Auduc Vincent Bois, the Archive du Ministère de la Culture, Wilfried Gourdon, right from the beginning of this enterprise, set up a guide of sources on the history of teaching of architecture and we had funds at the Archive National and Departmental Municipal um, Architectural Schools. Arlette Le Duc also steered an oral archive um, project with 25 people, with the former people in charge of the ministries, Bernice Gossuin, etc., whom we'll be hearing this morning. Our objective was also to wonder about the origins of the current uh, teaching practices based on the fact that the changes that followed 68 did not totally erase decades of uh, teaching. And these are the constitutive lines of the Beaux-Arts school. The persistence, the reminiscences, the resurgence of this past are also present just as well as uh, the innovations. So we have tried to learn the premises of the history of architecture in the 20th century by interrogating the École Nationale Supérieure de l'Architecture. And in order to do so, we did go and meet them. We wrote their history histories, and we had um, cross-sectorial thematic thoughts. Twice a year, we met in one or two schools. Uh, we went round France. And in the winter of 2016, we were in Strasbourg, and Nancy joined us. In June 2017, we were in Toulouse and then in Bordeaux. In December 2017, we were in Nantes. And Rennes joined us. In June 2018, we were in Saint-Étienne and then in Clermont-Ferrand. In May 2019 in Rouen, in December 2019 in Paris, where we visited three schools of Paris Val de Seine, Paris Malaquais, and Paris La Villette. And then the pandemic, which completely changed our schedule. It's only a year after that we started our seminars with um, online conferences. In February 2021, the Ecole de Lille, and June 2021, the schools of Lyon and Grenoble organize seminars. And we're very happy to be here. We're very grateful to the Cité de l'Architecture et du Patrimoine and the director, Catherine Cheviot, who is welcoming us here today, and Guillaume Selem, who had welcomed us in 2016, and Marie-Christine Labordet, who received us very kindly when we had organized the preparation of today's meeting. Going around the France, visiting the schools, well, we visited a few schools, and 
here a few examples. The Église Saint-Pierre de Firmini, le, the vieux old port in Marseille, the Hurley, the Collège des Écossais in Montpellier. And we met all the people working in these schools and we discussed about this history. We always were welcomed openly by the headmasters and we'd like to really thank them for that. At Paris Malaquais, during its launching, we were received by Mrs. Nasrin Serachi in Strasbourg, Eric Cross, and I'd like to thank the headmasters of these schools, Philippe Bach, for having put the first tone of this program. Uh, he was hoping that the story of his school would be written, Eric Cross who wanted to enlarge this idea to the national level, and Jean-François Briand, Philippe Seren, and Sarah Reichert, who is a director who all followed this project and ensured until the last few days the management of this long program. In Toulouse and Bordeaux, we were welcomed by Moïc Rère and Philippe Cougrand, in Nantes by Christian Dautel and Marie-Christine Renard, Saint-Étienne, clermont forand by Jacques Porte and Agnès Barbier, in Marseille and Montpellier by Hélène Corset, Maillard and Alain Deré. In Rouen by Raphael Labruni, Paris, Malaquais, Val de Seine, La Villette, La Villette by Luc Léocher, Philippe Bach and Caroline Le Courtois. Lille by François Andrieux, Lyon Grenoble by Nathalie Mesureau et Aunt Marie Vosnac and Paris Belleville by François Brois. Rare schools remained away from this program and we regret it. Everywhere else, the atmosphere was very warm, a lot of buffets, a pasta salad that we all cooked together in the school in Toulouse, and the vegan dishes from Paris Val de Seine. And when the lockdown asked us to use uh, video conferencing, the absence of earthly foods was compensated by the discussions like the round table of the architectural school from Lyon to Vaux-en-Velon that will remain in everybody's minds. Teachers and researchers mobilized to organize these meetings and write the first pages of the history of their schools. It's in Strasbourg with Amaldine Diner, Toulouse, uh, Henrico Chapel, in Nantes, Gilles Bienvenu, Saint Etienne, Leon Garlev, Clermont Ferrand, Geraldine Texerido, Marseille, uh, Jean Lucien. Bonilo Annabella, Juan Tricia Mehan, Paris Val de Seine, Antonia Brucoul, Paris Malaké, Anderbar, Paris La Villette, Isabelle Grudet and Aurélie Timsit, Lyon, Philippe Dufieux and Christian Marco in Grenoble, Stephanie uh, Dardour and Sibyl Levaux, Lille, Pauline Focadet. Paris Belleville, Antoine Perron. To all, we owe a great gratitude. Some publish monographies. Julien will talk about it this morning during the round table with all the people who've launched this uh, project. In several schools, the uh, documentalists um, came up with uh, documents uh, from uh, the sellers. So in Rouen, we discovered uh, the drawings sent from a prisoner camp in Ofnac during World War II, or in Bordeaux, the Cahier des Sujets de Concours, uh, which was prepared by the regional school. These documents were put in perspective in commented exhibitions in Paris, where Anne de Bar and Maxine Comer show the history of uh, Paris Les Beaux-Arts or Clermont-Ferrand, where Glenn Gaeca, Claire Le Duf exposed the drawings of um, 1910. This is a regional school that was opened in 1943. As we had wished, each seminar was the opportunity to deal with a particular topic. And each time we launched a call for submissions. In 2016, for the beginning of this enterprise, we wanted to take stock of the situation. That was the state of research, as we called it. In 2017, we launched the first topic on the teaching practices and theoretical writings. In 2017, teaching architecture 
considering international exchange 2018, the two themes were the places for the teaching of architecture in France and the policies of teaching and research in 2019, a social history of the teaching of architecture and teaching architecture in the greater Paris region across history, 2021 at Lille, Paris, Provence, and in 2021 in Grenoble, teaching and professions. Marie-Jeanne Dumont and Mr. Koedic will talk about the salient points that we've received and they'll talk about the discussions. During all these events, a lot um, were really involved, some for the organization and others spoke and others did even more. It was a collective adventure that welcomed all those who were interested in the teaching of architecture. And here there are some 20 PhDs, and you see the names here on this slide. Some committed themselves in thesis, and some questioned the history of an establishment like l'école des arts décoratives, the evolution of certain teachings like theory and construction, the renewal brought by the urban project, the visions on developing countries or the design built. It looked at the changes in the faculties, the feminization, the arrival of Latin Americans. And to this project, we also had the participation of some 60 teachers and documentalists, and most of them come from architectural schools. We were joined by some academicians, and we would like to thank them for their substantiated analyses. We accompanied several people who were full of passion for this activity, which was for a long time theirs. We had the great pleasure of welcoming personalities, and their route was related to the fate of these schools, and they took part in the roundtables that were organized during the seminars so as to talk about their history, as in Bordeaux in June 2017, in Rouen in May 2019, or in Lyon and Grenoble last June. Among all those uh, who realized this program, there is one and the scientific uh, people, Daniel Le Cody, Marie-Jeanne and myself, would like to particularly thank Amandine Diener, who ensured the coordination of this project. Throughout these years, she wore all the different hats with all the competences. She was extremely efficient and she's an extremely kind person. She went far beyond what we expected. She organized the seminars, ensured the coordination of the cahiers that were then published, which she's still doing for the encyclopedia, and she will talk about this at the end of the day. Beyond her activities that took her a lot of time, she kept teaching as a lecturer at the Institut de Géoarchitecture in Brest, and she continued her research on the history of uh, the teaching of architecture by proposing articles, notices, publications and by preparing the publication of her thesis that will be in the book stores in next year in February 2022 how to teach the history of architecture. So booklets were published during each seminar in the handouts you've received. You have the latest booklet that tells us about the seminar that took place in Lille. Their achievement was followed by Amaldine, and they were proofread by Vilma Volz with a particular attention on the contents and the format of the articles. And I really thank her. And all the conferences were published online in the Carnet de Recherche du Comité the histoire that I mentioned earlier on, thanks to Agathe Delège, etc. And those involved in this program, and there are many, they are of all ages and they work in the architecture schools. In this vast panel, you have those who began a career, or PhDs, or young teachers, and those who went past these degrees. And then you have fewer 40 year olders and the duration of the program was such that all those who supported it and its geographical coverage raised a lot of awareness and the spin-offs are obvious in the publications 
today on all this. And we hope that we've opened a project that will go through many developments in the future. But now it is time to take stock of the situation. And we'll be doing that this morning by Daniel Le Coetic and Marie-Jeanne Dumont, and then by Arlette Auduc and Berenice Gossuin, and then finally by Gilles Bienvenu. In the afternoon, we'll talk about the international outlooks on various aspects of the history, thanks to Beatrice Colomina, professor in the history of architecture at Princeton University, Francesco Dalco, emeritus professor at the School of Architecture in Venice, and Akos Moravansky, emeritus professor of the theory of architecture at the Goethe Institute in Zurich. We will welcome them with great pleasure and we'd like to really thank them for having taken part in this event. And Marie-Vonne de Saint-Pelujean, president of the Comité d'Histoire du Ministère de la Culture, will conclude and she gave life to this project five years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Daniel and myself, we don't have any slides, but we'll try and, um, and start uh, where we stand in terms of content. I reported that of a global history of teaching, opening up uh, to uh, all types of discoveries, teaching was from within the school and from outside uh, our, our uh, lines. Paris, regions, abroad. Uh, challenging the uh, positions from the teachers, from the professor, history, economics, uh, pedagogy, uh, talking also about institutions, from ministries down to uh, the keeper of, uh, of the school. I mean, there was food for thought around. Even the school has been looking on this topic for a long time. We're very much impressed by the pedagogical approach taken by the teachers, and we went around front, around 10 stages. And all the more so, we had a lot of content to try and understand the time limits, the time horizon, or oh, probably back to the origins. We very often had to think about the 19th century and back to the 18th century sometimes. Very naturally, we went smoothly down to the very recent years, so that our 20th century became one and a half century in a way in our studies. A wealth of thoughts as to the participants also, because we got to, to get a few generations of research workers. Uh, we had a PhD, and Marie mentioned, but many others we would like to mention were part of our uh, very work, work very loyally. Anne de Bar, Marcine de Comer, Gilles Bienvenu, and others that joined us. And they did follow our uh, route. Very loyally, Christian Marco, for instance. Then we face the various approaches of these various generations, the teachers, researchers, sometimes <laughs> some oppositions in what uh, the 1970, the 1970 people who did not find uh, exactly their thoughts in the younger generations, and they did oppose their thoughts. So where do we stand now in these uh, seminars? Because the exhaustive content you will be finding the 10 uh, notes, 700 pages in these booklets. And you will have them online on the site of the Comité d'Histoire. The final publication is due within one year, full of these uh, thoughts. It is quite a subjective approach, a personal, if not biased, approach that we are, uh, in fact, providing an editor with Daniel. On my side, two uh, periods of time were striking to me in that history. One, the problem of World War One, World War Two, because World War One and Two, <coughs> well, they represent very little in the challenge of modern architecture, neither in the history of a teaching of architecture, as when these are decisive moments for architecture, sometimes a turning point, a reform, a crossing point. So some of the aspects have been developed during these meetings, and I will present two examples. World War One. We often mention the creation of the regional schools and new uh, rapports between the regions and the Paris uh, centralized authority. 
But again here we heard about uh, significant contributions on another item, which is not a detail because it uh, uh, gave birth to a number of outlooks. The Gazette d'Atelier, the booklet sent to the um, uh, school to the students of architecture on the battlefront. A couple of pages on a monthly basis. A lot of these uh, leaflets sent due to the generosity of American committees with or without American students, by the way, so that uh, the French students and architects and previous uh, alumni, because uh, a previous student is an architect, to exchange uh, news between those on the battlefront and those at the back, or from several battlefronts, or two several battlefronts, so the poorly had news about their counterparts, even death, military medal given to one, found families, help the widows, the orphans sometimes for the uh, oldest uh, friends. A number of uh, cartoons and that spirit of friendship was maintained. So useful, very successful, even though it was a basic element of communication to have been striking among the uh, students so that this gazette became the Gazette de l'École des Beaux-Arts. And these leaflets were at the origin of a getting together of all the workshops and association. We call them the mass to become the large mass at the end of uh, the war. That was officially personified and materialized at the end of World War II. It emphasizes the solidarity among maintained because of uh, the wars that has in a way crystallized that getting together between the students to become an association that has become a power in the teaching of architecture until May 1968. This gazette might have contributed to crystallizing a community of students above and beyond the various uh, disciplines. And in the 19th century, you might be the student of an atelier before becoming uh, the student from Ecole de Beaux-Arts. As well, now you become a student of Ecole de Beaux-Arts, and then you belong to one of these uh, workshops or ateliers. So you see a reverse situation that has become very important in the 20th century. World War II now. And afterwards, we're no longer talking about the poilu in the trenches, but war prisoners and over 40, hundreds and hundreds of architects and students are in the concentration camps in Germany or working camps. So they get organized, whether it's a prix de Marie Bernard or architect of the historical monument, to teach and uh, help uh, their uh, young fellows to take exams. And you see that organization, this is quite surprising, was set up with the Ecole des Beaux-Arts de Paris so that uh, the drawing equipment could be sent to them and they could send back the project in France to receive mark and um, become graduate. Jean-Louis Cohen had mentioned this aspect of his exhibition, Architecture in Uniform, and the problem uh, remained later and was enriched during our program. In Rouen, we saw the drawings of that previous uh, student from uh, the student of Rouen, the Aflag 17A in Austria, where Henri Denmar was uh, teaching. And the most surprising is that he was already graduated as an architect, back to his studies in his uh, prisoner's camp, sent his drawing, got a rating, a mark. And it all happened as this, this uh, prisoner war camp had enriched his uh, studies in a way. So, so he graduated under the sponsorship of one architect from the historical monument. More recent work uh, f uh, showed the full scope of this uh, phenomenon and hope they will be published. We have a young uh, researcher worker from Montpellier, uh, Dominique Manchin, who showed the, uh, the condition, the material condition, the ambiance. He has pictures included, the content of the library. We know the content of the library is uh, individual books, the exercises put forward, and all this through uh, private uh, uh, archives uh, with the families of these previous uh, prisoners of war. He showed that in this atelier, you had many more students than many of the schools around, as if we had regional schools, but in Germany. Hence, validated uh, down to becoming a graduate, validating these uh, studies in Germany. You see, this is an offshore or delocalized type of or decenter type of um, students. 
then the reform of um, the schools of architecture under the regime de Vichy by the Secretary of uh, Fine Arts of that time, the Minister of Fine Art. The reform was first cancelled in part, then was forgotten. This was done on purpose after the uh, liberation, but we can reassess it differently take a new approach, given that it already gave uh, the master as a PhD of architecture, three different um, cycles, and PhD was the first of these uh, cycles. Anticipating 50 years before this uh, famous um, uh, current PhD, another interesting thing, May 1968. We thought we would have a number of communications on, P on May 1968. Nothing, no proposition on May 68. But we had a pre-May 68 and a post-May 68 that was enriched by a number of uh, studies, as if May 68 was one step in a much longer period of time. First of all, a pre-1968 period. Well, we traced the continuity um, along about 20 years. So before 1968, what did strike us was the historical reminder, relevant, very strong, from Florence Fontenay. We learned how to look differently at the 10 or 15 years before the, 1960, the May 1960 revolution, identifying a political challenge. She helped us look into the administrative difficulties, very difficult to apprehend through the ministerial uh, re uh, reports. Then after um, the May 1968 revolution, um, along the 70s, was not only uh, demonstrations, uh, repetitive uh, strikes and um, educational chaos. No, from my souvenirs, um, but others, we learn and remember that it was a period of, re of a renewal, a very rich period of freedom, but also a lot of uh, evolutive research year in, year out. This is what did strike us. To the nearest three years, we had um, uh, students had different memories of uh, their uh, programs and curriculum because programs kept changing every year. We went backward, like in Belleville, and we had other experiments in other places with a variety of content from which human sciences, construction, with the experiments of the third world. Uh, in our teaching curriculum, actions uh, in science in the third world. We had what we called antenne pédagogique, operational local uh, uh, workshops, the Seven workshop, on which we had a whole presentation without mentioning uh, urban development, which in fact uh, were quite similar to the official content of um, what they study in their engineer school. But this, in fact, uh, did not last for a, for a very long time because early in the 80s, a great stability uh, was uh, installed. And then, like the last 20 years, I personally looked with with a new kindness, I would say, research and experiments carried out uh, after the 70s. Two other steps, and then I will try to be fast on this one. Becoming international, going international, going global. We had a number of uh, presentations on international type of topics, on global topics. And um, this was something new for us because on these topics, we had a very vague idea and um, that have clarified uh, among all these meetings. We learned what the artistic and architectural um, teaching was in the French colonies, for instance, between two wars and right after World War II and a whole presentation on Indochina. Imagine. Then we had uh, all the students from Central Europe, the impact of the teaching in the country of origin once back in their country, which was the case of Romania, for instance. The difficulty of students from Switzerland who hesitated between Paris and Berlin as to the choice of their studies at a higher level. Uh, they had schools, but uh, they, they thought they would uh, rather go Paris or Berlin, often Paris. 
We had presentation on the contribution of French architects to the Beaux-Arts in constituting new schools in different countries such as Iran, the UK, the United States. There were some French greetings uh, brought uh, the uh, new concept of phenomenology in U.S. Uh, schools. There was nothing at all. And now we now have uh, detailed contributions on these uh, topics. Uh, what did strike me also was uh, to hear about daily life of American students in Paris early in the 20th century, their workshops where they lived together, their suppliers, the subsidies they received, the type of relation they kept with their previous um, uh, fellow uh, students who had come back of uh, all the equipment brought in after World War II. Then we had uh, a massive arrival of teachers uh, from foreign countries after May 1968. How many Latin American uh, architects from Quebec, engineers from Eastern Europe came in front to strengthen or reinforce the um, teaching teams, very few teaching teams we had after 1968. And all these uh, teachers or professors trained to modern traditions, they, they brought their contribution to a renewal of our education with small units. Uh, not that we had much, uh, but they still brought something in the 70s. Last, females, and how we have more and more women in, in this uh, business line. You know it intuitively. But a PhD it gives us a lot of detail. This is a work in progress, by the way. A lot of detail. We knew that uh, more and more the um, architectures had become uh, more and more fem feminine, female at a later period, but very rapidly. And you know that in our amphitheaters, in our ensembles, we have many more uh, women than men. And, and, and um, in a great percentage, something like 70% uh, females, and uh, the rest are males. As well, until May 1968, there were very, very few uh, architect, students architects. And Sylvie Bouconnage uh, identified 3% 3% in the 20th century, 500 uh, females on 1,800 people. We didn't have on 1,800,000 uh, architects. We don't have testimonies on the very first uh, female students because they were not interviewed uh, except for this new generation, by this new generation of researchers. But we do have elements as to access to this uh, profession of those who graduated right after World War II, early 50s. And we now know that the very first students went to the École Spéciale rather than to the Fine Arts School, the Beaux-Arts. More difficult to get into the Fine Arts. And they were uh, from Russian, Polish origin, mostly foreign countries. As to those who, despite the obstacle, went to the Beaux-Arts School between the two world wars and after World War II, the females who studied architecture were a single women in their family, all uh, from uh, families where you only had girls, daughters, and not boys. So you see, the fact that you had a boy in a family meant that the boy went to the school of architecture rather than the, the, the daughter. But if you had one daughter only in the family, well, maybe she could become an architect and uh, be the successor to her father, maybe. Okay. So they, only, or they became, in fact, architects when they married to uh, one of their fellow students. And we see in some stories of this very first female that very often they help their husband. <laughs> they help studying uh, together with the husband. They never graduated and they had to take care of their children and sometimes forget to uh, graduate. So you see, we have stories of that kind, uh, moments of life that are quite specific. And we don't have all this data yet, not fully data. Not full data, sorry. But uh, this uh, study did not uh, show um, as to the teachers where, whether we have more females than males. This is still work in progress. We would like to have more testimonies on the daily life of uh, females. The pioneers, uh, as uh, always, in the school that were very much male-oriented. This is something to be explored, but for which now we are starting to have a major insight. 
And I forgot uh, to mention that we have a lot of sociologists looking into this matter. And when you see the appetite of the current students, the, the, the female uh, students in, in the master degree, and we have no worry as to how quickly they will um, become or be graduated and become architects. Well, this is very quickly what I wanted to say and what did strike me. To round it off, I would like to say that that history of teaching in the 20th century, what we noted was that uh, those uh, students, groups of students, testimonies from the students, were uh, uh, preponderous. In fact, they represented the majority. Each architect is a previous student. I don't think we could say the same thing today. I'm not convinced that our students today feel they were, they were previous students a uh, number of years before. It is a question that I raise here, which is a question for us and professors and teachers also. Thank you very much. In 2016, during the inauguration of the ENSAVA program, most of the speakers had mentioned the magnitude of the project that we had decided to open. The teaching of architecture in the 20th century was fairly unknown, whereas the 19th century was more familiar. And thanks to Marie-Jeanne, we found out that now we know a lot more, but this project we checked all this, and in this um, cloudiness, there were some obscure points. These are the 15 regional schools, 15 schools, including the one in Algiers and Delat that had the status, but not that of Ile de France because it was very short-lived. And we had to add this other school uh, with the and Saïs, uh, this uh, destiny of Alsace that we talked about. So three moments uh, um, when we started a project where we did a lot of research uh, and publications, Rennes, Nantes, Strasbourg, Toulouse were about to follow this uh, path. And today we're very satisfied to see that all the schools, without any exception, are searching for their genesis, their history from the oldest one, Rouen, that opened its doors in 1904, up to the Benjamin Saint-Étienne, which was created in 1972, and so therefore it has a new pedagogical uh, course. And there was the exceptional welcome that was reserved to us, reserved to this uh, mobile seminar that was presented earlier on by Anne-Marie. Each of these seminars dealt with a generic problem, but there were sessions on the history of the host establishments. And what's very important to say is that um, we, it wasn't just located to that place, but all this information was very precious to understand the general movements that had crossed teaching and also the professional sphere involved in the establishment of these schools and their functioning, and which became their products. We heard that most of these schools came from afar and were part of a long tradition of the teaching of architecture, often very rudimentary and sometimes very sophisticated. The roots of these schools had to be sought in the 16th and 17th centuries, as in Bordeaux. So understanding the turn of the 19th and 20th century, uh, that's when we decided about the regional schools. And we had to look at the drawing schools um, at the time when the mechanical arts were soaring in the 19th century, mention the continuities that were organized, um, the closeness of the schools in uh, Rennes, etc., and uh, the abundant uh, suite of establishments. And after the revolution, they didn't stop to perpetuate this teaching of architecture. The Ecole Centrale from 1995 to in the schools of drawing architecture. And at the end of 19th century, they became national schools. That was the case in Dijon, Lyon, and Algiers, or regional schools from 1879 onwards, where the state decided to co-fund with the cities, welcoming them, these regional schools. Architecture was taught at three levels. The third, preparing the students to the uh, admission to EMSA. So this was known in its broad lines, this route, with a certain precision. I'm thinking about the Ecole des Saints de Rouen. There was the, that was the topic of a thesis. But we have an enlarged vision on what happened in these schools 
skills and in this uh, teaching of architecture. I'm thinking about Montpellier, where we discovered Alphonse Goutes, um, who is not in the history now, but is going to happen. And he was the universal teacher of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in stereotomy, perspective, linear drawing, and then finally in architecture. He left a course in 25 volumes, 4,800 written pages. So archives were collected on this, and they still have to be exploited, but they are very promising. We've also improved our knowledge of the structure between the regional schools, the Beaux-Arts, and the regional architecture schools when they existed. And these structures existed until 1980s, because the Ecole des Beaux-Arts continue teaching architecture with means, forms, and diverse objectives, and especially the information of the architect collaborators that we also dealt with. So this long journey was just before the invention of this profession of architecture. And to talk about the history of the regional schools has allowed us to understand all this under the different a different angle from that we had until then, which had been adopted by these major organizations, which were highly centralized, adopted by the Central Society and the SADG. I'd like to mention Edouard Lovio when he was at the presidency of the SADG. When we discussed the opportunity of creating these regional architectural schools, he was saying France is neither big enough nor rich enough to see several capitals, and Paris provides enough architects to the country so that the profession might be already uh, full of people. Teaching to prepare good um, uh, architects in the provinces, I don't think that this teaching should be very high or very theoretical. So we know about the torments um, of Lovio when he finds out that 62% of the students in architecture are students who are non-residents. I'm using this expression discovered by the Central Society because those not living in Paris were reputed as being non-residents. There was a position of vice president that was also reserved to a non-resident. So our seminars were the opportunity to have a new look on our colleagues from the provinces and uh, on the organization in form of in the form of associations and trade unions with the provincial associations and this was essential for the creation of the schools for their functioning at the beginning and they called their schools their daughters so there was a new look on the faculty of the regional schools and the headmasters in 1968 and at a lesser degree in 1992 where there was a change in the way in which we hired the teachers and that changed things. And this teaching had been considered uh, objectively except for Tony Garlier in Lyon, Gaston Carcel in Marseille or Robert Malsevas in Lille. And we heard with great interest that all the discipline had been professed by uh, top-rate professors from universities and they thought it was good to teach in schools where there were only maybe just 12 or 15 students and before 1941 they weren't even forced to have a baccalaureate but they these schools were um, eminent um, places and Jean-Paul Martin in 1969 when he was appointed teacher of architecture and research, he said that until 1968, uh, the schools in the province were uh, the jungle counters of Enceva. And here there was a lot of rehabilitation work, more rehabilitation of the schools. I talked about the quality of the teachers. I want to mention some of them. Law is a very elitist type of teaching, and the schools could count on the best specialists in this area. In Bordeaux, where you have Jérôme Mafiel, and in Rennes, where you have Georges Oliedvaux, and we talked about him yesterday. And I don't want to let out this other legal expert who is very specific because after having uh, studied law, he became an architect. And I'm thinking about Andre Chimerlin. And we went through his uh, route during one of our trips. He was the founder of the Carré Bleu, which is a very precious uh, book, and professor in Montpellier until 1964. It's true for all disciplines. Uh, history in Rennes, uh, taught by Jean Bousquet before he took uh, over the Ecole Nationale Supérieure in Ulm. And Cicero Salta will maybe talk about this, some former collaborator of Le Corbusier and 
they re-edited their publications a few years ago, and they were teachers in Saint-Étienne and in Rennes. So 1968, earlier on, we said that uh, there wasn't that much um, emotion. The regional schools did not really show the Parisian events and the consequences, and sometimes the regional schools were the, at the vanguard of all the events taking place. And I'm thinking about the summer workshops of Paul Quintran in Aix-en-Provence from 1965 onwards. Paul Quintran, who convinced about the need to install real research in schools, had preached before 68 so that it might be so, and he created in 1969 the GAMSO, and we often f forgotten that the first laboratories that were really sustainable were created in the provinces, the GAMSO and the CERMAA, which became the CERMA, which was created by Jean-Pierre Penot in 1971. From the pedagogical point of view, things were remarkable in the regional schools. They became pedagogical units in 1968, and I'm thinking about um, the Carenet, where there was a self-organization system governed by La Boule, uh, an anti-Greece organization that we had resuscitated for this cause, which provided the necessary regulation. And we shouldn't forget this uh, attrication, which was unequal between pedagogy, research, and critical kindness vis-a-vis -vis the profession in Nancy with Jean-Pierre um, Eprom, where there was a wonderful team. Philippe Boudon was one of the loyal people in the team. Alain Sympathie, Bernard Berger, Guy Benesso. So a strictly Parisian team, you'll tell me, but the second generation was um, from Nancy. And this was uh, well known, but uh, it was based on oral tradition, and now it is disappearing. And now we have managed to um, give it a new birth. And this was the topic of these very interesting roundtables, especially in Bordeaux and Nantes, with the confrontation of uh, viewpoints that was mentioned by Marichal. But the essential is in the passage to the written um, form with the testimonies and critical analysis which characterizes research. The M. Savin books were a precious landmark. The research books of the Comité de l'Histoire du Ministère de la Culture, I encourage you to read them and to reread them online, which are extremely precious. And reviews edited by the schools that were cross-sectorial in Bordeaux, for example, that talks about the history of this establishment. And then we must not forget the scientific reviews that I would qualify as uh, classical, and they're particularly interesting today for architecture on the one hand and for teaching on the other. The thesis were presented and mentioned. I'd like to mention the surprising uh, part that was Strasbourg and the doctorates from Strasbourg. You'll see them later on, Gauthier Paul, in the round table. That's going to follow, and Amandine Diener. And of course, I'd like to thank her as we did earlier on, and she will be presenting the encyclopedia with Francois Chalam. She was the real working force of this program. And we should not forget the exhibition catalogs because several schools produced um, exhibitions around their history, Bordeaux, Grenoble, Strasbourg is going to do it very soon in order to celebrate its centennial, and testimonies. So these testimonies, um, that is the raw material of research in our area with Le Duc um, and Berenice Gossuin, who immediately afterwards will present the surprising collection work that was carried out by the Comité d'Histoire, and a few schools provided um, a real stone to this, and that's Marseille and Clermont-Ferrand, and they carried out this very precious uh, collection. And we observe with great pleasure that some of the players uh, in the past few years uh, spontaneously published their memoirs, very precise memoirs. Yesterday we talked about this, so I'm going to exclusively mention those that were not mentioned yesterday. For a long time, Jacques 
Kamal Chef, who was professor of sociology in Nancy. He'd been the only one to carry out this exercise. And in 1990, he published La Charrette au DGV, 20 years of sociology in an architectural school in the province. Well, Jean Pistoletia published the School of Architecture, Chronique Grinçante. And here we talk about Marseille. And recently, 2015, Daniel Dujardin, who was the first director of the school in Clermont-Ferrand, and he told us about his memoirs on the school that was, and he was almost the founder of that school. And the roundtable that will follow later on, on the books that are being prepared in the regional schools, well, they will tell us more about all this. So all this is extremely rich and precious and almost unexpected lens took the whole attention and the regional schools were extremely rich rich and their current success shows that this history had to be explored and to conclude i would like to add to the thanks mentioned by Anne Marie uh, because actually she's the one who had the idea of this program. She set up the team and she was greatly devoted and she's still devoting herself to this. And I'd like to thank Anne-Marie. Uh, donc, uh, il nous revient, uh, de, uh, it is now a, a pleasure to present the results <coughs> of the specific work of the Comité d'Histoire on the problem of sources. Six years ago, within this uh, very uh, remit, we had um, taken the commitment to work on the question of archives with our colleagues from the ICAV uh, department of the Ministry of Culture. And so far as these archives, and this is where we do see so the progress achieved along the last six years. These archives well, were not so well known. They were scattered around the different uh, formats, and this we did not know at that time. And by the way, is that a question that came up uh, as we entered this program? Because uh, this type of questions of these sources was at the origin of a report drafted by Michel Maslet back in 1980 uh, for the Prime Minister and presenting these uh, questions um, or uh, worries as to the question of sources of architecture and of the history of architecture in general. Now, to that effect, and to work on the problem of uh, sources, the Committee of History, and Anne-Marie mentioned the problem uh, earlier, recruited an individual in charge of this uh, mission, and we worked on this uh, problem of um, a guide on the sources. <clears throat> this was a research program whereby we wanted to uh, create a tool for assistance to research, very straightforward, exhaustive as far as possible, which seemed to be contradictory when you uh, first look at it. But we wanted researchers and uh, students to work in uh, favorable conditions. We also hoped, and this was phase two, and by the way, through what uh, was said uh, to the present uh, time, we thought that <clears throat> this might uh, favor or help developing new research work looking into these archives. What did we do? Step one, we wanted to list as exhaustively as possible the sources of archives as they were taken from the teaching of architecture. So this was limited, in fact, as an objective to the um, teaching on architecture, educating on architecture. So we listed down all the organizations whom we thought, or which we thought, well, we knew for some of them, but not all of them, we thought they could, in fact, uh, hold sources of archives on architecture. Once this list was first set up, we then prepared a questionnaire, and this was the very first uh, major step, a complex one, preparing a questionnaire 
on what we wanted to obtain uh, from these organizations. <clears throat> the question there, by the way, I could have shown you the list of questions, but uh, to make it short, 11 questions we had in the list addressing to all the organizations susceptible of uh, uh, of the holdings of child cars that we had listed. The scope of action was name of institution, uh, the title, School of Architectures, National Archives, Department Archives, SBAR, Museum Archives, other institutions, etc., etc. The address, name, an email of the person answering that question, and the last, uh, there's the heart of the topic, sources of archive on architecture and the teaching of architecture in that institution to help the institutions also. We presented the works of school, the uh, publications on the teaching of architecture, administrative archives, etc. Now, clearly enough, some of the institutions were going to reply back we have nothing, so this is rather straightforward. And as to the others, we were asking a description of the sources of architecture, the teaching of architecture. You will see this uh, later. And then we said, now the question could not only apply to the teaching, but also research on architecture. Hence, we added to this uh, question uh, other questions on funds of archives from the research laboratories with the same problems, same definitions, <clears throat> the description of the archive of funds, the content for the um, research laboratories. So we had something that found, we found could be wider. We added two additional questions which we found were essential. One. Uh, printed um, articles, reviews, leaflets, uh, uh, reports. Um. By the way, opening uh, up a bracket here, the Committee on History will revert to this later, but I would like to say this. It can be interesting. The Committee d'Histoire has, uh, in fact, put online, or not online, but uh, digitalized, in fact, all these all these elements, and I can tell there are a large, large number of articles, reviews, reports, etc. All this has been uh, digitalized or digitized so that if you wish to go through these uh, articles, etc., you can uh, re revert to the uh, Committee of History link online. We also ask these institutions. Uh, we ask whether these sources uh, had been uh, digitalized or not, whether they're digital or not. Some were not, so we had to. Then, the question was disseminated to these uh, institutions, the one we had delisted, and well, we were rather skeptical originally because, um, by the way, you know, along that piece of work from the answers we would obtain, um, this represented a major work. We knew that some of the institutions holding these sources are so busy uh, by the work they have to carry it out internally. But in fact, we're very much surprised, positively surprised, very positively surprised, because we got back a large number of replies so that at the end of the day, we updated more than 900 uh, archive funds. It's considerable, 900 funds of archives, considerable. So we had to sort them, process them, which was step two, <coughs> processing these uh, results. Processing the result, what does that mean? Preparing a file for each of these institutions and the, the motives, the reasons for these archives. Thanks to the help of our um, colleagues from the archives, the archivists that we referred to earlier, we decided uh, 
to have um, uh, all these files put under the international archive standard so that it could be disseminated as widely as possible. So up to international standards with a note of the archive tabs with 23 inputs. And that was not simple to set up, I can tell you. So this was part of our work. Once this was done, the question remained, what about disseminating this data to the public? Well, we gave a lot of thought to this time-consuming job. And by the way, thank you to my colleague from the archives, because uh, they helped us um, tidying and doing a bit of a cleaning up in our work. We had started from the idea that uh, we would um, develop a new autonomous database. And our colleagues from the archives told us uh, without any difficulty that such a database, uh, well, presented to the Committee of History, would uh, meet a lot of problems of logistics, cost, a time-consuming effort. So what we said that we went to a, a fast solution together with a system hypothèse used by the Committee d'Histoire in the framework of the research work. This is an internet platform, hypothèse, whereby we published an optimal notes on the 900 archive funds creating about history of architecture. So they represent the guide of sources which I am now going to present. So this is online and hosted on the site, which is that of the research note of the Committee of History, gtc.hypothesis.org. From that specific site that was developed, we now have specific items on the research program dedicated to the teaching on, of architecture. That's a very conventional uh, type of research work. And I hope you all went to consult to this uh, carnet de recherche of the Committee of History. So you have specific inputs on our project Pour une histoire de l'enseignement de l'architecture au XXe siècle, which you have here, and you have all the details on our research program. And you can access online to all these sources and the guide of sources on the teaching of architecture. This is it. This is it. You have the various links here in the slide. On the slide, on the link, on the side, sorry, so the speaker, on the guide of sources, you have four specific links. Link number one, guide of sources, is, an ex is a summary explanation of what I have just told you, instead of the art, what we did, how how did we uh, develop this guide of sources? Then, you can also access and read the uh, approach taken, the sites listed, etc. I'll let you read a little. And the fundamental uh, link, the guide of sources, properly speaking. So we decided to input in this guide of sources the centers of archives. We thought it was the most straightforward uh, approach for the students, but also for all research uh, workers. I don't want to present the whole list. Uh, you have the exhaustive list in front of you. These are the sites for which we have information, the schools of architecture, department archives, municipal archives, national archives, 
the uh, archives of uh, the labor environment, libraries, the center of archives and center of uh, architecture of the 20th century, the High School of Architectures, INHA, the Mediatek, uh, the archives on patrimony or, or heritage, etc. So we tried to be as exhaustive as possible, yet we know, and this we saw as uh, we used this site, that a number of uh, different institutions are not in the list, even though we thought we had included everyone. But the interest of the, of the guide is that it can be updated and enriched uh, regularly, which is what we have already done. Some of you have uh, provided us with um, names of institutions whom we had not maybe thought about, and uh, we realized that there are icons on architecture and the teaching of architecture in uh, places we never, never thought about, municipal archives that we just did not uh, know, we had not heard about. So if in your research work you find institutions that are not listed in the guide, please do not hesitate in telling us, and we shall increase these sources, update these sources, and add these new institutions. Some of you have already done it, telling us how comes you forgot this municipal archives or this or that place, city, whatever. So never hesitate in telling us, which is also what we wanted to tell you about the guide of the sources. It can be enriched. Uh, by the users, or through the users. How does it work? You click on one of these institutions. Suppose you take the department archives, department in the French sense of the term. You obtain an exhaustive list of all the departments that contain funds on the topic. By the way, the sources on education to architecture, teaching of architecture. It is complex to discriminate between what is architecture and, ar and architects that have uh, um, set their own archives in funds in which you have teaching of architects. It's difficult to discriminate between the two, but you see the funds are listed very exhaustively. So. Let me take Allier, which is a French department. We click on their uh, archive of fund. There's only one fund, by the way. The Gustave Bayer fund, placed by the architect to this department archive. And if you click on that Gustave Bayer fund, and you have, this is it, this is it. The file I mentioned with 23 input data. You have, on this fund, what has been uh, done, what we have prepared with our colleagues from the department archives, the reference number, the level of descriptions, the titles, the various titles, and all these fields. In fact, uh, are compliant with the international standards of archives as uh, they stand in the national archive system, for instance. You have the dates of the first, the name of the producer, the equipment, the language, the historical background, of uh, the conservation, of the curation, and you have a link here in this Allier department to Gustave Bayer. So, we put a link toward their dedicated site, the Allier department site. And by the way, this is true for all the institutions. We have the address, conditions of access, because in fact, some of the funds were open, um, provided, uh, we provi provided we gave uh, access to the site, and a quick presentation of the content. Exactly what you assume when you go and uh, search for national or department archives. Okay. We tried, we successfully tried to do the same work for the 900 sites in the tool 
from the, from the answers received. In 2016, which was uh, year one in the project, it was not enough to complete the work on the 900 uh, sites. So we had to extend our work. And Wilfried Goudon, who worked on it, he's not with us, but I would like to thank him um, wholeheartedly because he did a considerable uh, job. New work, something innovative, so we had to extend his, um, his work with us. You will find all this. I don't want to take too much of the time. Uh, Berenice would like to take the floor. Anyway, you will find all these files for all the sites that we have identified. And again, if you be kind enough to help us enriching the site, enriching the content, the guide, do not hesitate. Then I'll be very quick on the rest. This is uh, the presentation of the project uh, for which the guide has been uh, had been prepared, and uh, because we're going to revert to this later, so I will not linger on this item. <clears throat> and step four. Or input data form, which is well, acknowledgments. So we acknowledge all those who've helped us, but especially. This is exactly where we place the link to the site of the institution that kindly helped us, so that you can uh, get to know better these uh, centers of archive. In parallel to this, we've published four pages. So four pages or 24, the interpreter cannot hear properly. These four pages, you can get them as you walk into this uh, conference room. And I insist this is first and foremost a working document as straightforward and exhaustive as can be for researchers, students working on the topic. And it is our hope that uh, you will be able to use it and that it will give you the possibility to turn to new research work on this uh, um, item of the teaching of architecture. It is an objective because we wanted to produce knowledge but also give us the tools to organize this knowledge. And then we started a campaign on oral archives and I would like to hand over to Berenice Gouzin to present the topic. So after this presentation from Arlette Oduc on the Canada de Recherche and our source guide, here this is another section on the creation of new sources because among the ambitions of the program and Savant is to preserve traces that are disappearing to provide food for future research. And so we have a campaign to collect oral archives, and these are testimonies from various people from the field of teaching of architecture. So there are three sections, one which is dealt with by all the researchers taking part in the program to therefore ask all the players uh, linked to schools. The second dealt with by the committee in charge of the schools with all the former administrative people at the ministries uh, in charge of the policies on architecture and the last section with the 
all kinds of personalities, and I'll go back on that point. And before even contemplating these interviews, I'm going to tell you about the method. Arlet told you about the method regarding the research booklets, and we have um, prepared a list, a corpus of people to be questioned, and then we had two categories of players, members from the administration and then architects by and large, that is uh, former students and teachers. And the list of students and teachers was then divided between the local players um, dealt with by the schools and the other players, uh, the testifiers uh, that were dealt with by the researchers. As for the administrative staff, they were dealt with by the Comité d'Histoire, and the prerogatives of this comité became larger. They had to deal with the uh, testifiers, and uh, there was an institution that was absent from the program, which was the École de Chaillot. So they had to deal with that school also. So 27 interviews were carried out by the Comité d'Histoire, I carried it myself with Pierre Minaval for some of them, or with other personalities like François Chalin, Daniel Le Quadic, or Amandine Diener. And a majority of administrative staff, as you can see here, with, for example, Georges Armand, who was in charge of the service d'architecture and créature. Um, Artistique, and he talked about his daily life after May 68. Then you have the point of view of the administration, and the atmosphere he describes is a fundamental reflection and hoaxes. So, uh, testimony on daily management and the lack of budget, so he could not deal with the training of architects. Another example, the interview with the Vanda Diebold, who was in charge of the Bureau de l'Architecture from 1983 to 1987, and then manager of Architecture and Patrimoine from 2000 to 2003. And her testimony and the testimony of Jean-François Texier is a testimony that lasts two hours and 17 minutes. And here you can see the evolutions over a long period of time between the Ministry of the Equipment and the Ministry of Culture. I will like to mention, uh, so you can find these interviews um, if you're interested uh, online. And I'd like to talk about the École de Chaillot to show that um, this uh, is a question of having more varied uh, profiles of uh, headmasters and headmistresses and teachers who were former uh, students of the school, like uh, François Loyer, director of the school from 2000 to 2003, and who tells about his difficulties in terms of the administrative recognition of the school and other testimonies with several dimensions. And here they broach several institutions, not only the École de Chaillot, but Berger Mouton, who talks about his uh, route as a student because he uh, was admitted to the École des Beaux-Arts, then at the École de Chaillot in the 70s, and the uh, teaching he developed in the school with the stereotomy class, and then the class of Georges Duval on structuring and consolidation that he kept until he retired from the École de Chaillot. And all these uh, intertwinings, we can find them in the testimonies of those who were appointed as great um, testifiers or cross-sectorial testifiers, and especially the testimonies of Jean-Pierre Penaud, who um, told us about his route as a student, first in Nantes and then in Paris, his experience as a teacher and researcher in Nantes, in Nancy, and in Sao. And now to go back to the methodology, well, it was set up with the help of Pierre Mignaval and Florence Descamps. So first, uh, an interview grid that you can see here, a grid according to topics that served as a guide for all the interviews. And this is still available for the researchers who are interested in this campaign, in their own oral archives campaign, a grid which is made up of several sequences, which begins with an introduction of biography, which is more or less long. 
And for the administrators, it was a question of understanding the place in their career of this position for which they were going to be interviewed and how their route had led them to certain responsibilities in this teaching of architecture. Then you have four themes, a pedagogical content, a reform of architecture, the place of um, a teaching, and of course, uh, all these themes are not uh, addressed to all the um, testifiers. To prepare these interviews and adapt them to the various personalities, each time we would prepare the CV before each interview. And here you have the example of Max Carrien. And in bold letters, you have the moments of their career that was particularly interesting to us. And it's based on these uh, CVs that we prepared the questionnaires specifically for each of the players um, in accordance with this thematic grid. And as for the people in the administration, Task. We carried out interviews which were semi directive because the period during which they had responsibilities in the field of teaching architecture, that is limited to a certain number of years. And so we didn't have to opt for a whole narration of their entire career for the major testifiers and for some teachers. These specific questionnaires you see an extract here for the joint interview of Vanda J. Bolt and Jean-François Texier. And so this is divided between chronological periods according to the successive responsibilities of Vanda J. Bolt and Jean-François Texier joined his team from 90s to 93 and he was integrated to the second period. And in this precise case, we had contacted Vanda J. Bolt and she wanted her colleague to witness together with her and we had a very fruitful dialogue and the souvenirs of one would revive the memory of the other and vice versa. And for the cross-sectorial testifiers, well, here it is the narrative of their career and here you have Jean-Pierre Pénaud which is more personal. Her interviews are the narrative of their life, where the testifier talks about his experience, with led, which led him to choose architecture or to enter a school of architecture, the years of study, the professional years. And here you have a biographical introduction and three parts, one on the training received, the second on the teaching delivered, and the third on research, the professional practice being more cross sectoral tutorial to these different parts. Um. And after these interviews, we had to produce an analysis sheet, a critical analysis sheet, as we called it, of this interview, so that we could memorize the whole um, interview and the impressions. So these are personal notes. Uh, about these interviews, but these interviews were dealt with in chronothematic sheets. We didn't transcribe them fully because the objective was really to set up this compendium of archives and to allow its consultation by other researchers. So this is why we chose the chronothematic sheet with the time codes, with the themes, approach, the names mentioned, the institutions mentioned, and all these to come up with the catalog of um, Bibliothèque Patrimoniale to have access to all these interviews. So they are all inventoried here in this catalog, in the catalog of the Bibliothèque Patrimoniale du Ministère de la Culture, with the Histoire de l'Architecture au XXe siècle. The interviews are not online. They are not meant to be online. You will find via the catalog, just as for the written archives, the explanatory booklets for all the interviews. And to listen to these interviews, you'll have to go to the Comité d'Histoire, contact the Comité d'Histoire to have access to all the documents that have just presented for each of these interviews and the recording also as such. And of course, you can search with the keywords. I want to show you a sheet an explanatory booklet for Benjamin Mouton. So you can see the type of information you get here. And in this research, you just have to look 
search for the name of the person interviewed to have access to the sheet and you have information on the interview and you have a summary and you can also do a research per keyword in the whole base and so you can get all these interviews thanks to this repertoire of the names of people mentioned the institutions and the themes I discussed so here I've done research on Benjamin Mouton and he appears in the description of the interview and in the summary. You see, if he's mentioned in another interview, the other interviews will also appear through this research. And before thanking you for your attention, I would like to make a call, as Arlette did, to those who launch interview campaigns, audio or video, on the teaching of architecture. Please contact us, Arlette, myself, or the Comité de l'Histoire in general. If you want your collection of oral archives, if you want it to figure in the catalog I just mentioned, because then we can give your work a certain amount of visibility through the um, catalog du Ministère de la Culture and through the research of keywords, so the sources we've produced and that we will keep producing, I hope so in any way, so that it might be enhanced at the national level. Thank you for your attention.